So without further ado then, I'd like to move on to, to introduce our first speaker. Um, David Higgins has been uh, Chief Executive of Network Rail for just 11 months since February uh, this year. Undoubtedly, uh, the Chief Executive of Network Rail is the hottest seat in the industry. Uh, in, in industry not renowned for having quite a number of uh, challenging roles, this is certainly a big one. And I think David's made a remarkable progress in just, just 11 months. Joining Network Rail from being Chief Executive of the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority, and I think we've all seen those wonderful pictures on TV and, and, and the pride that we feel in the fact that Britain is actually ready for the Olympics well in advance of them starting. So with that background, I'd like to welcome David Higgins. Thanks, thanks Tim, and um, congratulations on your new role. We hope to continue our close relationship, not as close as it was the other week at the Railway Ball where Tim and uh, myself and eight others were jammed into a mini, so uh, which was quite fun. So um, I'm very pleased to be here to address this um, 10th annual conference here of the Institute of Economic Affairs and the Future Rail Conference. We meet in difficult economic times, um, however infrastructure and rail in particular plays a very important future now in economic recovery. The government right from the top of the coalition recognise that infrastructure investment can help revive and drive economic growth. Not only that, but it can help to do it more equitably across the UK. On a daily basis, our railways move millions of people, thousands of tonnes of freight across the country. Investment in rail infrastructure is not only good as a national asset, but regionally and locally it helps both small and large businesses and the national supply chain. Just last week in the autumn statement, the Chancellor announced another £1 billion of investment in rail infrastructure. Electrification Transpennine, investment many new, uh, in renewal of many of our Victorian structures, the old bridges and tunnels. Money to take forward new route from Oxford um, back to Bedford. And then dozens of other projects where there's a strong business case. And soon, um, in the new year, we hope an announcement coming through on high speed too. Never have we received a clearer mandate from the government. The mandate is help us drive economic recovery for the, for the country. But while infrastructure investment in rail is a key part of the nation's strategy of economic growth, uh, it's absolutely clear that we've now got a new challenge. And that's investment must work harder than ever before. This is a task that's more difficult than it sounds, particularly in the context of rapidly increasing demand for the industry as a whole. It used to be the norm that when the economy changed, that rail demand matched that. GDP fell, so did passenger and freight demand. That's now changed. Past decade, 40% increase in passengers. By 2034, so that's when we expect high speed to first stage to open, we could see passenger demand almost doubling. And in freight, we'd expect freight to have increased somewhere from 300% above where it is today. Those are huge figures, a huge challenge for our industry and for our rail network. There will be more capacity, of course. Thameslink, Crossrail, High Speed 2 itself all make a difference. Other investments in signalling, electrification, rolling stock. These are all improved performance and reliability. Nevertheless, large parts of our network will be full, particularly the key London commuter routes. So the challenge is clear. How do we deliver and manage the capacity and meet the demand of the market while getting the best out of our infrastructure investment? Importantly, how do we do that without compromising on the last decade's improvements in safety and punctuality? As is often the case with the railway, tackling the issue of capacity means balancing a series of trade-offs. In this case, expectations on cost and performance. Undoubtedly, meeting the capacity challenge is going to require further investment in infrastructure. But it's also going to require realistic expectations on further performance improvements. Throughout control period three, we saw a rapid increase in reliability. But as we packed more and more train paths into our limited network, the resilience of our entire network has been squeezed. Despite significantly fewer infrastructure failure incidents in total, particularly over the last um, 
control period and the first two years of this control period, delay per instant has grown, particularly in the last few years. A delay at the height of rush hour can have a knock-on on effect for the rest of the day. Our packed timetable allows little resilience. It's what us of the, the use Heathrow and, and the M25 will clearly recognise. An incident at either of those assets early in the morning infects the peak hour in the afternoon. So as we plan for control period five and even further and beyond that, the government and our industry must agree what our priorities are. If capacity is key, and I think it is, then we must fully set out and agree the resulting trade-offs. Every train path in our most densely used commuter routes into our major employment zones are a very valuable asset. This is good to have a challenge. It's a challenge of growth. Um, we have the biggest investment in infrastructure since the Victorian era. Soon we'll have, before the Olympics, New King's Cross opening, 12 car trains in Thameslink comes on before Christmas, a new London Bridge station and the spaghetti of lines that come in and out of London Bridge through Thameslink will be fixed by 2018. Crossrail, of course, in the same year. So when you look at it, instead of just planning, many of the infrastructure improvements happen within the next six years. Capital investment that's been delivered and the further investment plan constitutes the largest investment in our rail infrastructure since the Victorian era. The investment of the last decade, whether it be in trains, projects to grow the network, or simply the day-to-day -day work in operating and maintaining and renewing our railways has helped deliver a better service. And the result of that is clearly in the figures of demand and consumer utilization of the railway. It's brought millions of new passengers to our network. Meeting the demands of this growth means that we need to maintain a sustainable level of investment. If we're to meet the challenges of growth, build the capacity, we need, um, we need to plan for a resilience in a fit for purpose railway. And therefore we need to continue to attract capital and increasingly new sources of capital, potentially from outside government. Although the government's commitment to rail investment, including its plans in High Speed 2, have so far been unwavering, it's clear that that's not a blank check. The government's not going to continue to give us a huge investment that's given us in the railway unless we reform. Despite our role in the economic um, economy in the recovery, we've been given a clear message that has been reinforced not only from the government and no doubt in the new white paper, but in Sir Roy's report for our organisation. I'm sure when Sir Roy sets out his case for reform early this morning, he'll no doubt make the point that despite the huge growth in demand over recent years, the unit cost in terms of pounds per passenger mile it's, has barely shifted. This is a statistic that's actually fairly damning on our industry. So as we've had high growth in passenger demand over the last 10 years, we haven't got the productivity improvements that we need. The title of Sir Roy's report says it all. The challenge, realising the potential for our industry. And we have a huge potential and we have to take that challenge. With world class skills of our industry and the policy support from government, now is the time to demonstrate that rail is a good investment and we can attract uh, we can offer attractive returns and therefore deliver increased efficiencies. But this can only be achieved through the reform of our industry. In response to Sir Roy's report, the industry has set up the Rail Delivery Group, which is looking at a wide range of cross-industry issues. From my perspective, it's been remarkable how that group has come together and identified on half a dozen key areas to focus on. And the rule has been to follow the money. And that's exactly what we've done. It's a very focused group. And reform and change of our industry is within our grasp. For example, we all know that the contractual regulatory framework is too long, too complicated. One size fits all approach is now out of date on a network with multiple markets, different geographic requirements, and multiple jurisdictions. With the spirit of reform in the air and with the periodic review uh, and refranchising around the corner, now is the time to attack this issue um, in the interest of our industry. We need faster, leaner, better value for money contracts that link Department of Transport, ourselves, the regulator and the rail industry. The future of our industry must be built on greater collabor collaboration between key players as opposed to the complicated contractual interdependencies that currently mark our industry. 
More effective collaboration, new mechanisms of funding are vital to deliver the higher end savings that Sir Roy's report has set out and our industry should be able to achieve. But this will only be by smarter and stronger, smarter franchises and stronger partnerships. By smarter franchises, we mean ones that are longer, with a stronger focus on outputs, less prescriptive and flexible inputs. Sensible balance between risk between the operator and network rail and the government. It's important that whatever arrangements are put in place for the future, they don't have the perverse effect that some have at the moment, which provide a disincentive to growth and to grow revenue. Equally, we must develop a framework that encourages both us and the train operators to work together, whether it's to reduce costs, make better use of existing capacity, or to deliver the projects that are going to ultimately increase capacity. Strong, by stronger partnerships, I mean creating valuable partnerships, one that's based on trust, local issues, and joint objectives. We're already making progress towards this. Our alliancing approach to our customers has started. Devolution of our routes is a big step forward for Network Rail. It's one that makes us closer and more responsive to our customers. Um, and in some cases, we'll take this, this further, creating deeper, deeper alliances. At the moment, we're talking to train operating companies to see whether it's possible to define and put in place agreements that drive us towards closer collaboration, the right financial incentives, while at the same time maintaining separate accountability for infrastructure uh, and potentially for running of trains. In future, we believe that incentives are about improving outcomes, whether it's for the customer or for the taxpayer, rather than simply encouraging organisations to take a lower risk approach. We see a future where we can share responsibilities, where, delivering, where we deliver results aligned alongside our customers. We also need to work much closer with our suppliers. Very pleased to work with some of the best companies in the world, here based in Britain, delivering our major projects. We can work a lot more closely with them, allowing them the opportunity to shape the delivery of projects across the railway. These changes in the way we work will be complemented by changes in structure of our organisation. Our investment projects business will have a separate unit within our own group structure. Our plan is for clearer client specification. It enables greater innovation from early engagement with suppliers and provide more transparency for benchmarking Network Rail's performance. These are just a handful of the multiple reforms and innovations being discussed and implemented across the industry at the moment. Gaunt has been thrown down by, by Sir Roy, by the Treasury, by the government and by the Department of Transport, and by the thousands of customers that use our railway every day. It's clearly an enormous challenge. We have the benefit of growth, and we have a great industry to take that forward. We also have an opportunity through our supply chain to encourage a legacy beyond the physical assets that we deliver. For example, through attracting new investment in skills and expertise, creating new jobs, and bringing more talented young people into our industry. And Network Rail, we're getting increasingly involved in engineering academies, and starting with our involvement in the JCB Academy. We also work with TFL, Crossrail, and others, heavily involved in the National Skills Academy for Railway Engineering. Through the Academy, we're focusing on how to address issues such as mobility between various organisations that have similar needs, so we don't end up with a situation where we're competing for scarce resources, but we work together to get the most out of, the, out of investing in resources and skills. Particular programs include our apprentice program and our graduate program. We put a lot, a lot of time and effort into this because we believe that as industry, we have a very good sales pitch for young people wanting to enter our industry and the workforce. These people are going to be the future of our industry and will help drive the productivity we seek. We are in a unique period in the next two to three years. We have bipartisan support for our industry, we have a huge investment program, and we have strong demand and growth. It's an opportunity that no one in our industry should let go. Coming years will be exciting for us. We'll also see physically tangible results of investment, so King's Cross, London Bridge, Thameslink, Crossrail, these are all fantastic investments that the public's going to see coming to fruition within the next eight years. We have to match this delivery with continued innovation, evolution in everything we do. And so it would be great at the 20th anniversary of this conference in 10 years time that we're able to sit back and think that the decisions made now, the impetus for reform have carried forward and changed our industry to one which has coped 
and taken up the challenge that the growth in our industry provides. Thank you.